Welcome to Kalamazoo Public Library. We're waiting for all of these contributors to this work as they meet each other face to face for the first time. <laughs> so we are thrilled to be able to host this event. We are big fans here at KPL of Bonnie Joe, and I'm not gonna say anything else except welcome. I'm Karen Trout, I'm the community engagement librarian here at KPL. I also want to thank BookBug, this is a bookstore, who is here selling uh, many of Bonnie Joe's, oh, <laughs> Bonnie Joe's um, titles, as well as you can pre-order her book that's coming out in the fall, I think. But with that, I am going to introduce Lisa DeRose, DeRose who is one of the co-editors, and she'll introduce everyone else. So thank you. And actually, it's even more fun. I get Andy Oler and Ross Tangadal, my other co-editors, to join me here, and then we'll we'll get started. So, so thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Karen, for uh, such hospitality. We feel so welcomed here in Kalamazoo. So, thank you all for coming out, um, and thank you for joining us as we celebrate the launch of Michigan Salvage, the fiction of Bonnie Jo Campbell the first scholarly study of Comstock local literary hero, Bonnie Jo Campbell. Um, as Karen mentioned, I'm Lisa DeRose. I'm one of the co-editors, and I'm joined today by my other co-editors, Andy Oler and Ross Tangadal. I'm also pleased to welcome several of our contributors, Becky Cooper, Marsha Meyer, Doug Sheldon, Ellen Lansky, Charles Cunningham, Raymond Durin, you're in, sorry, Raymond, I even have a note. <laughs> um, did I, I hope I got everybody. Our, so, and, and that, I have to tell you, that's like 50% of our contributors. So that's a lovely uh, showing. And we're also thrilled to welcome Andy Oler's family who have come all the way from uh, Florida and in Indiana. Right and we, Ross and I, yeah, here we go. We want to we want to say a special thank you to Ada, Silas, Miriam, and Elin for their patience and for sharing Andy with us for four years as we worked on this book. So a special thank you to you all. Our plan is to spend some time chatting about the origins of this book, Bonnie's contributions to Midwestern literature, and the process of documenting the work of a contemporary writer for future generations. Then we will bring up Bonnie, who will give us a taste of her upcoming novel, The Waters, which will be published by W.W. W. Norton in January, which we know is 2024, but it's soon, right? We, we, you're making us wait, but that's all good. We wait with anticipation. And then Bonnie will entertain your questions. So um, I, I first want to begin by simply acknowledging the joy of gathering to chat about our shared admiration of Bonnie Jo Campbell's books right here, near the township where she was raised, a few miles from the school she attended as a child, in walking distance from the university where she received her MFA, just down the road from Kalamazoo College, which awarded her an honorary doctorate. Um, I think the story of Bonnie's authorship illuminates the reciprocal nature of books and reading, the way a community a neighborhood, a family, feed a writer's craft, and the right way a writer in turn nourishes a community. As many of you know, Bonnie was raised in Comstock on a small family farm with milk cows, horses, donkeys, chickens, and occasionally goats. Besides the livestock, she was also reared among lively storytellers, a charismatic mother, and a town like many small towns full of legends and myths. Comstock provided Bonnie with rich material and a landscape that fed her imagination and longing, a childhood spent among its ponds, creeks, swamps, and that mighty, or as Bonnie is apt to point out, ecologically troubled river, the Kalamazoo. But Kalamazoo, and specifically Western Michigan University, played a pivotal role in nurturing and boosting her craft. When I met Bonnie in 1995, I was in my second year 
of the PhD program in literature at Western. I still recall the day I encountered her because she was, and I think still is, a sort of joyful disruptor. She made herself known right away outside my office door on the ninth floor of Sproul Tower. I heard a booming voice and I glimpsed a towering figure. Of course, that's not hard to do to me. <laughs> but perhaps most unsettling was her cheerfulness. We were all anxious graduate students, especially me. What business did she have being so joyful? <laughs> I didn't note it at the time, but Bonnie had just come over from the math department, where she had recently completed her coursework for a PhD in mathematics. But she had grown discontented with math. This is what mathematics professor Art White told me in 2015. He said, Bonnie was good enough in math, I believe, to have preserved to the PhD. She got through all her coursework for that degree and was prepping for the prelim but she didn't seem to be enjoying herself. She would write humorous comments in the margins about blocks to creativity and the like. White felt an immediate kinship as an academic advisor. Oh wait, I, sorry, White felt an immediate kinship with Bonnie and seeing her distressed encouraged her to take a writing course. As he's told me, quote, as an academic advisor, I always tried to maximize happiness for my students. It was easy to see how to do that for, Ma for Bonnie. I now claim her as my greatest advising success. <laughs> I drove her away from mathematics. <laughs> On White's recommendation, Bonnie enrolled in a workshop taught by Jamie Gordon, MFA fa writing faculty and later National Book Award winner. Um, after that, Bonnie threw caution to the wind and mathematics too, and she joined the MFA program where she took classes with Stuart Dybeck, M MacArthur Fellow, as well. Bonnie was certainly lucky to have landed in Art White's classroom. He knew exactly what to do with her, how to advise her, because she was at a university that fostered interdisciplinary conversation and coursework. Where a math professor who valued books had a robust relationship with the English department. Bonnie and I were very fortunate to be students in an English department that was chaired by Dr. Shirley Clay Scott, who anchored, yeah, well, should we clap now? <laughs> who, who anchored us in a vision that fostered collaboration and intellectual curiosity. We are grateful that, Sh that Shirley joins us today. We are also grateful to be joined by my mentor and Comstock native, Dr. Catherine Joslin, as well as my favorite ombudsman, Dr. Tom Bailey. We also want to acknowledge Norma Van Rienen, the person who gave us the tools and courage to approach one of our most daunting tasks at Western, teaching freshman composition. <laughs> and Norma, thank you for being here. In this spirit, the collection Michigan Selvage also elevates the importance of teaching, as every contributor in this book has also provided a teaching activity to accompany their essay. Bonnie has not only been the recipient of good teaching, she is a devoted practitioner of it. In fact, while she was a graduate student at Western, Bonnie won the top teaching award in both the English and math departments. A frequent speaker at conferences and book events, she has led workshops and taught classes at over 80 colleges and universities across the country. Now, if you look at the author's biography on Bonnie's website, you'll note the emphasis on the adventurous life she's had. Hitchhiking across the US and Canada, scaling the Swiss Alps on her bicycle, and traveling with the Ring Ringland Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus selling snow cones. But the truth is, Bonnie got all that wanderlust out of her system early on. She returned home to Comstock 36 years ago and has remained a devoted citizen and ambassador to this place. Neither her literary fame nor her worldwide fan base have, have persuaded her to strike out elsewhere. 
Many a Midwestern writer has been lost to sunny California or swanky <laughs> New York City, but Bonnie chooses to remain here. And so the place that fed and nurtured Bonnie is the same place that she transforms and evokes for us, readers, scholars, and teachers who see in her compelling portraits of landscapes and characters a reflection of our own communities. And now my esteemed and lovely co-editors will explain how Michigan Salvage demonstrates how Bonnie's writing contributes to a more complex and nuanced understanding of Midwestern life. So Andy. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I've said this uh, numerous times to Ross and Lisa and uh, to other people in the room too, but this this is not something that happens uh, with or for academic books, and so it just it speaks so much uh, to Bonnie being in the community, and you know to the to the way that we can uh, kind of come together to celebrate that, um, and we're so excited to. I mean, we're the first book on her work, uh, and and that's exciting for us, and I'm just thrilled. Uh, that you all have come out here today. Sorry. It's only going to get worse when I get up there, too. You better practice now. <laughs> <laughs> Just to dangle it from the ceiling. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. What I said was a lot of thank yous and nice things. <laughs> <laughs> all right? Just roll with me on that, though. Uh, uh, I, so you know, my family came, and, and this was like a, a big and sort of spur-of-the-moment trip. Uh, and my parents drove up from the middle of Indiana. So, you know, thank you to them um, uh, for being here. So uh, thanks to you all. Um, so I first encountered Bonnie's writing in about 2010. Um, it was soon after American Salvage came out. I was in Bloomington, Indiana, and I was writing a dissertation on masculinity and Midwestern literature. So I came across a blurb. Uh, uh, by Tom Chiarella in Esquire magazine for American Salvage. And I was like, I'm writing about masculinity in Midwestern literature. This sounds like something I should check out. So I tracked down the book. I read the book. Uh, I taught most of it in kind of an intro level course. Uh, and then eventually, a couple years after that, I wrote a conference paper on Bortaint, which is the uh, American Salvage's closing story. Um, that paper became part of the conclusion to uh, Old Fashioned Modernism, which is the scholarly book that came from the dissertation that I was writing. Um, so I'm going to pause here from moderately shameful plug. Well done. Uh, <laughs> well done. <laughs> here we go. It was like yeah. self-promotion. Good. Uh, I couldn't bring actual copies of the book with me. But I did get the press to make me some flyers, and there's a discount code on the flyers, <laughs> which flyers. are up here on the corner of the book table. So if you're so moved, oh. old-fashioned modernism, rural masculinity, and Midwestern literature. Woo. Yes. It's got a lovely cover. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So in old-fashioned modernism, I focus on how Midwestern writers from the 1920s to the 1950s told stories about rural masculinity. So here's the main argument, and this is a quote from the, from the book. When Midwestern modernists represent the disruptions of agricultural modernization and the struggles of the Great Depression, they don't wish for the revival of pastoral masculinity. Their focus, rather, is on how their characters and communities can negotiate the failures, challenges, and promises of their disorderly modern moment. All right. So Bonnie's writing obviously comes much later, all right, um, than these like 1920s, mid-century stories that I was writing about. But I saw some similarities uh, between those older texts and her version of the rural Midwest. In the conclusion uh, where I wrote about Bortain, <clears throat> I wrote that it tells the story of people who, as contemporary farmers, are part of a system that compels risk. In the story's combination of uncertainty and opportunity, she imagines a way for rural communities to thrive. So in short, I love the way 
that she shows the messiness of life and the hardships that people face while still insisting on their value. And, and I want to read a, a short quotation from her that's not from Bortain, but is my absolute favorite line in American Salvage and probably in all of your writing. So this is at the end of King Cole's American Salvage, and it's about a young man scrapping out catalytic converters. It says, they were dirty and rusted from the slush and mud and road salt, but each of their bodies contained a core of platinum. And it's, I mean, it's such a lovely line, and it, it hits so much of what I was trying to say in old-fashioned modernism. And it's just one of the things that drives me to want to continue to think about her work and, and her writing and, you know, the pla places in the rural Midwest. Uh, and so, like, this, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So, uh, Ross and I, uh, along with several of our colleagues, uh, including Doug Sheldon and Don Burns, um, we nominated Bonnie uh, for the 2019 Mark Twain Award, which is given by the Society for the Study of Midwestern Literature to a living writer for distinguished contributions to Midwestern literature. She, she received that award uh, at the SSML conference where uh, Ross and I organized five panels of scholars and creative writers to discuss aspects of her work. Um, this enthusiasm was basically unheard of, all right? The 2019 conference was the best attended, most lively SSML conference in all the years. I, I was there for about 10 years or so, uh, all the years I attended. Um, uh, Bonnie gave a reading. Uh, Lisa interviewed her on stage in relation to that reading. And like, sort of unbeknownst to us, maybe, maybe predictably to a lot of you, uh, she just charmed the pants <laughs> off of everybody in the room. Um, it was just, it was, it was wonderful. It was, it was such a rousing success uh, that Lisa, Ross, and I decided to solicit the essays and the comics that became American Salvage, or Michigan Salvage, sorry. American Salvage was before. Uh, so we, we're thrilled with the resulting book, um, with all of the wonderful work that these contributors here are here today and the ones who couldn't be here uh, that they gave us. We are uh, just delighted to have a good home in Michigan at Michigan State University Press. That was important to us, uh, and we were glad that they were interested in, and have uh, supported and shepherded the book uh, all the way through from conception to, to publication. Um, so thanks again to you all uh, for coming out this afternoon. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Ross, and he's going to talk about why these kinds of author-focused edited volumes, why they're valuable, and then also maybe sort of what may be coming in the future as this field develops. So thank you. I brought signing pens for my friends, Lisa and Andy. Give me another one. Give me another one. Um, <laughs> oh, wait. What did I do? I need something to pitch you for. Sorry. Oh, thank you. So once you buy your copy of our book. <laughs> <laughs> we will gladly sign it. <laughs> oh, this doesn't happen, friends. You have no idea. We've, uh, between Andy and I, we've both written a monograph, and we've both done other edited collections, and this is the only book that we've all worked on that has gotten any sort of treatment like this. So there's a lot of people to thank for that, and we're really proud of what we've done so far. But, um, but we can talk about that later. So I'm going to talk about, um, I'm a bibliographer, which is I study the book as an object of commerce. That's the, that's the, the materiality of books and what that means. Um, and so that's my little remarks are kind of centered on those things. All right. So how do we begin to remember contemporary literature? So much of what we study as literary scholars exists sometime in the past. My primary research subjects, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway, have been dead for 83 and 62 years, respectively their last major novels released in 1934 and 1952. Fitzgerald died thinking himself a failure, and Hemingway met his end in an Idaho cabin, having lost his ability to write after extensive electroshock treatments at the Mayo Clinic. Yet, both now benefit from entire fields dedicated uh, to the continued study and appreciation of their writing. Biographies, too many to count, especially for Hemingway. There's like 25 Hemingway biographies, <laughs> and one really good one. <laughs> I won't tell you which one, you figure it out. Um, 
complete descriptive bibliographies, which are detailed catalogs and physical descriptions of every printed piece an author published in their lifetime. Monographs, which of course are single theme or single subject studies. Edited essay collections like ours. Um, journal articles, conference presentations, the list goes on and on. There's thousands of listings um, on Hemingway and Fitzgerald, right? So these men and their writing and their lives, I believe rightly so, have been and are being remembered on a daily, weekly, monthly basis in classes and all over the United States and the world. So I return to my original question. How do we begin to remember contemporary literature? Which authors become the beneficiaries of the vast machinery of academic memorialization? The courses and the conferences, the books and the special issues, the things that lead to canonization, if such a thing is still a marker of staying power. In short, it takes work. For over a year, Bonnie Jo Campbell sent me every journal, magazine, newsletter, and printed work that her stories, essays, and poems appeared in from 1987 to 2020, along with first editions and reprint editions of each of her published books. Books and magazines came to me in boxes that originally held kitty litter and Michigan blueberries. <laughs> in all, she sent me well over 125 individual printed works. My goal was to publish a descriptive bibliography of her work up to that point, becoming a part one of what I hoped would necessitate a part two. Thanks to her prolific work ethic, I should have no problem putting together part two. But I had to sell her on why this all mattered. Not only to me, I mean, after all, it led to a major journal publication, so that, that felt good, um, but also to her. And most importantly, to future generations of scholars and readers, which I don't think a lot of writers in the moment of their writing think about what are people going to say about my writing in 50 to 75 to 100 years. I don't know if that's something that a lot of writers spend a ton of time doing, mostly because they're too busy writing uh, to think about such things. So it didn't take long. My pitch was really simple, and it was over the first time I met her, it was over dinner in Lansing. The first thing I said, I said, I told her, if, you, if you're going to launch, if we are going to launch the academic enterprise needed to establish her and her work as major rather than minor, then certain documents need to be published. I might have said that exact sentence. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't like run for the hills. And I probably was wearing this suit jacket. There's a stain on it. Um, a biography a descriptive bibliography, and peer-reviewed scholarly uh, monographs and edited collections. Those are the three things that are needed. Two of those sound familiar, biographies and books. The middle one scares most people. But the detailed listing and description of all printed works amounts to a textual biography of an author. There is life in every item, each listing, each detail. Without it, in 50 to 100 years, um, there will be little memory of where all the work went. So now you can access that information in the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America, the foremost journal of book history and bibliography in the United States. Bonnie's uh, bibliography came out in the same issue as a Shakespeare article. So <laughs> she was pretty proud that she got to hang out with William Shakespeare in a 125-year-old you know, um, uh, journal. That's pretty cool, yeah. Shakespeare and Bonnie Jo. So with this bibliography completed, well, and actually bibliography is never completed. Fredson Bowers, the American bibliographer, taught us that. It's always ongoing. There's always another piece to be found. There's always more writing to be done. And so this is part one, up to 2020. And she's already collecting as she writes and gets accepted. Things need to continue to be collected. So I get more boxes of Michigan blueberries um, over the next several years. But the creation of a scholarly edited collection uh, seemed natural and right. Um, our excellent contributors established Campbell as an artist of the highest order, a writer dedicated to the people she knows and who she hints we might just be. Michigan Salvage is the first in what we hope are many books on Campbell and her work. But as the saying goes, someone had to be first, and we are glad it was us. Next steps in launching the academic study of her work include a biography by Lisa DeRose, more and more journal articles and book chapters in peer-reviewed venues, a collection of Campbell's interviews, which is currently being developed by Andy, Lisa, and myself, and perhaps even a society dedicated solely to the study and dissemination of her work. So to conclude, um, in conclusion, <laughs> I tell my students never to say in conclusion. <laughs> to conclude, eminent bibliography G. Thomas Tansel noted that, quote, Melville likened the creation of art to Jacob's wrestling with an angel. The texts of documents preserve a partial record of that struggle and the effort to make this record more widely known is a noble service, contributing to the knowledge we have of what it means to be human. So, not every author will receive the treatment we are giving Bonnie Jo Campbell, and only time will tell if our efforts are fruitful, successful, or noble. 
But the foundation, I think, I think it's noble. Um, but the foundation is laid, and the bricks are going up one by one as we begin to craft the means by which we help the future remember Bonnie Jo Campbell and the very human work that she continues to give us. Thank you. And now we're bringing out the big guns, okay? So uh, Bonnie Jo is going to come up here and join us and read from her forthcoming novel. So I'll leave this. Yeah. We'll get it way back up there. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, thank you guys for saying that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me it was going to be like this. <laughs> Because, you know, most of the world doesn't make writers feel like this. You know that, right? <laughs> most of the, and I, I mean, it seems silly to read from this right now, doesn't it? Or does it okay? No, okay. okay. And we'll just do it. We'll just do it. And, uh, yeah. and are we going to hear from Marsha, a couple other people? Or just, are we gonna, then we're going to talk, right? Yeah, we'll then talk. We'll talk. Yeah, we're going to talk. We'll, you guys we'll have questions. There, yeah. Okay. And then, um, so, yes, contributors, we're going to ask you to sort of chime in and, and talk. And maybe but sit up in this. the front or something. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and read the first paragraph, and then, um, and then, uh, and then a couple paragraphs in a, in a minute. I hope it works because I've never read from this. The thing is, this exists as an arc. Um, do you guys know that the arc is usually published about six months in advance, and it goes to the booksellers? And um, and I kind of got in trouble because I made over a thousand changes <laughs> since the arc came out. <laughs> And then, and then when I asked my, they changed my publication date. It was supposed to be published in October. And then I got some, I guess it's good news, because I was told that they wanted to wait to do a bigger release. So um, that it will be released in January. However, they had this arc made, so I was like, well, can I keep making changes? <laughs> and I got this note from the production manager who said, no. <laughs> You're done. So I think, I hope it's okay. But, but okay. So I'm just apologizing because I'm sure it's horrible and there's lots of mistakes in there. So <laughs> this is from chapter zero of The Waters. And you guys might have known this was, book was supposed to be called, the, called Donkey. Uh, I, it was supposed to be called Donkey. And like, I guess people said, You're not going to win the National Book Award with a book called Donkey. <laughs> that was The Waters. Okay, chapter zero, prologue. And I'm gonna read just the first paragraph and then I'll skip a little bit. Once upon a time, Masaga Island was the place where desperate mothers abandoned baby girls and where young women went seeking to prevent babies altogether. But in living memory, Rose Cottage on the island was the home of the herbalist, Ermine herself, Zook who raised her three daughters there. The oldest, a lawyer named Primrose, was the most accomplished. The middle daughter, called Mary, Mary Rose, called Molly, a nurse, was the most practical. And the youngest, Rose Thorne, was lazy and beautiful. Her means medicines, her tinctures, salves, and waters are now discredited in the light of day, but at night, the people of White Hart, Michigan, still use them if some tidy housekeeper or other busybody hasn't tossed away the unlabeled jars and bottles. Only tiny amounts of these fixes are required as they have become more effective with time. Sometimes just unstoppering a bottle is enough to release a cloud of soothing into an ailing household. The island and its women loom large in the dreams of local folks who sometimes wake up sweating from visions of witches in black, though the island women never wore black, or of crows watchful in treetops, or of swamp streams bubbling up through the floorboards of their houses. It is said that the island, where healing waters percolate, to the surface was a place where women shared one another's dreams, a place where women did what they wanted. I'm just gonna read a couple paragraphs here. So you got that Hermine's name, they call her, her name's Hermine, but they call her herself. 
The waters occupies the northeastern quarter of the township, 6,000 acres, and all of it, apart from her means section, is under state protection for a, half, for a half a dozen rare wildflowers and the Blanding's turtle, as well as the endangered Massasagua, Massaga, is what we call it in the book, Massaga rattlesnake. The state wetlands don't bring in any tax revenue apart from a few bird watchers stopping at the gas station. Even families in Whiteheart who have never farmed this area know how the waters can creep into low-lying cropland and undermine what looks solid. Half a century ago, Wild Will Zook ventured into the waters and fell in love with herself after she treated his rattlesnake bite and also cooked and fed him the snake that had bitten him. <laughs> maybe he married her because of some spell she put on him, or maybe just because it was the most outrageous thing a man could do in Whiteheart. And it did impress everybody, made him seem taller than he was. After they were married, he bought the bone set land for them at a tax sale and built the big cedar house from which vantage point he looked down upon the island, but he was never able to convince his wife to live there with him. That this high-ceilinged, two-story dwelling sat empty with its windows boarded up for 30 years was a testament to the power and de determination of her mean Zook. The people of Whiteheart loved to decry her stubbornness, both for refusing to live there and for keeping it empty all those years, and especially her refusal to sell any portion of it, of the it, to sell any portion of her holdings, the waters or the dry land at Boneset. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so I think we're going to entertain questions, Bonnie, from the audience. That sound good? Everybody, yeah. Oh, for everybody? Okay, all right. I wonder if I can pass this around. Well, well let's just begin I with think, I questions. Think, I think Tom's got one, oh, too. Oh, perfect. Oh, thank you. Yeah, all right, yeah. people who know how to do things. <laughs> Love it. And if there's not any questions, then we're going to think of things to say. Yeah, we'll just start talking. I yeah. don't know if that's what you want or not. But so that's next. Oh, of course, we have contributors here, too, who might want to chime in. Anybody? <laughs> so any questions for Bonnie? I mean, you know, we've been waiting for her to write here for a while. Okay. Oh, see, wait a minute. Yeah. It's like Phil Donahue. Feels, feels better. So, so I am curious, that, um, Chapter Zero, or the prologue, from a writing perspective, I'd like to know if you wrote that last after you understood your book and, or how you pondered what you wanted for your first paragraph, how you made that decision. Are these actually on? Oh, yeah. I don't even need, you guys know I don't even need one. Right. <laughs> I mean, for crying out, you can't, I mean, you almost can't answer that question because I rewrote the book hundreds of times. I mean, hundreds of times. I'm one of those writers. The way I write is I write a really bad book, and then I write it again, and it's a little better. And if I do it a few hundred times, then it gets better and better. So every part of the book was rewritten many times, and um, the beginning was re-envisioned many times. And there are people here in this room who saw an original prologue that was an original prologue, but it was very different than, than this prologue. So the, part of the reason for having a chapter zero is because it's funny, you know, because it's a prologue. It's and also because there's a mathematical element to the book. And so there's, uh, I mean, I, maybe I'll give it away that the, that the epilogue is chapter infinity. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, the book was written in every order, and every part of it was rewritten many times. Any other questions? Oh, you. Yeah, so um, 
when this came out and when you were working on this book, I was just curious, Bonnie, the, the themes that they came up with, the observations about your writing, were there revelations to you too? Or were there things that you were like, oh good, somebody got it? I, haven't, I haven't read it. Because it just came out, and I'm terrified. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed, and I feel like t crying every time I look at it, because I can't believe it exists. And so I looked a little bit at the pictures. You guys know there's cartoons in there from Monica Friedman. And, uh, <laughs> and we even were joking last night while we were drinking that there's like even there's a little bit of racy stuff in there. So if anybody likes that sort of thing, you know. You, you can think Doug Sheldon. Doug Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> look at page 167. Just go over there and look at it when you get a chance. Um, no, I mean, it's such an honor that this exists, and I couldn't puzzle out. I thought they were joking about putting this book together for a long time. I thought it was just a way of, like, you know, you're on these funny threads, you know, and people, they say funny stuff, and, oh, let's, you know, let's go on a vacation together to, I don't know, some Timbuktu or something, and then, oh, let's write a book about your work, and uh, then it was real. So I look forward to looking at it, but it, it, it I mean, it's such an honor, and you know, I don't know if you guys, I mean, I know there's a lot of writers out there, but most of the time we're, I don't know, I'm so insecure that I can barely get out of bed in the morning. And so, you know, I wonder if this will give me a little boost. That's what I'm hoping, <laughs> that it'll be like, oh, yeah, for sure, you should get out of bed <laughs> and write some more. Um, but I, I do look forward, no, I have, I have perused a little tiny bit. And I have, I was at the conference where some people were saying some nice things. And it, I mean, the main thing is that you can't believe that, um, I mean, because you have to, uh, most of the time when you're a writer, you have to apologize for writing because you apologize that you're not earning a living. And then if you have some success, you apologize to your friends who have less success because you're like, oh, it was just luck, you know, and because you feel guilty because you have success, and then, um, and it's all the luck of the draw, you know that, and you don't know, and like that 50, 75 year thing, I always use that as a, as a marker, because I always say, well, nobody knows if work is important for that long, so you will never know while you're alive if your work is important, but I think all of us writers, that's why all of us owe it, no matter how we feel about it, we owe it to ourselves and the world to absolutely take the most care we can with our work, to really write carefully and thoughtfully always, and also in a way to be as caring about the human condition as we can, because it feels so precarious and we don't know what the world is gonna be like in 50 or 75 years. So, you know, like, I mean, I guess it gives me a, you know, gives me that all the things I was already thinking, like, it's like, yes, keep, you know, keep on writing and keep on giving a darn about the written word and making sure that you take it seriously. Um, you know, even as far as, you know, being a promoter of reading books <laughs> in the most generic way that you can imagine. Am I on? Yeah. I'd like to add to that a little bit. Like one of the things that I love in a colleague, uh, in a writer, uh, in friends, I mean, is, is people who, who take it seriously, like whatever they're doing to, like, to do the work, to be serious and caring about it and careful about it. Uh, and I mean, I think that that's one of the things that, that draws me to, to Bonnie's writing. But that's also one of the things that was such a joy with this collection was to, to work with contributors who brought their own perspective, but weren't just tossing it out there. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, to do it the right way and to be thoughtful and to, to express it appropriately and, and, and to, to make an argument, but also to, to be respectful of the, the source material and of the, you know, the world that they're writing about. And, and so that, that was one of the things that, uh, 
made this book a, a joy to work on because we were doing most of the work on this book like during uh, some of the, the darkest parts of the pandemic. And, you know, to be, to be working with such good source material, for sure, but like, to be able to have a good meeting uh, with, with Lisa and with Ross uh, just over Zoom to be able to like reach out to people and then to have like this work come in that I didn't have the brain space to write much myself, mm -hmm. but to read somebody else's work and to, to help to shepherd it and to make sure what, like, what they were doing was going to turn out the best it possibly could, like, that was a, an amazing experience and, and kind of a lifeline during a really dark time. I, and I think we've talked about this before, so I think I can speak for the three of us on that. Uh, that just making this book was a lovely experience because of like, the people we worked with, both on here, up here and, and out in the room. So thanks to you all and thanks to, to you. Yeah, and maybe we should mention that I didn't have contact with the three of them while this was happening. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know how what the language of that is, but there's kind of like a wall. Yeah. Okay, I, I I can actually speak on that. Yeah. Um, so I think Bonnie likes us because <laughs> I know we like her. Um, you know, we most of us write about dead people, and so it's it's it, the dead people don't talk back. So when you write something under his Hemingway, you know, he's not going to, you know, reach out from the grave like the end of Carrie and grab my hand, right? <laughs> like, I, I, can, I can try to say things that I think might mean something, and if other people believe them, that's great. If not, you know, he has no opinion on what I'm saying. Yet, we put out a book, and we have someone who is at a peak in her career about to publish another novel, and it's very different to write about someone who is living and who is actively working. Uh, who is not a retired writer or who has decided to you know, put the pen away. Um, so part of that then is to take the work seriously um, is you have to avoid hagiography, which is hero worship, uh, that, every, that everything about the book is, you know, should Bonnie write an introduction? Should we dedicate it to Bonnie? Should Bonnie have a say in what goes in the book? Like, that's all hagiography. That's hero worship. And we, if we want to be taken seriously, and if we have a peer-reviewed collection, and if our contributors want to be taken seriously, and if we want to launch the academic study of a writer, we have to avoid making it look like we're, we're in love with her. Um, that's a very important part of this, this machinery. And it is machinery. Um, and unfortunately, with a lot of writers, you do get a lot of hero worship. I study two people, Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. People want to be Ernest Hemingway, which is very unfortunate. Um, and people want to drink with F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is very unfortunate. It's like they want to be Jay Gatsby. That's a terrible idea. Um, so. I, I think, I think, you know, I, I know what it takes to avoid hagiography. Because that's, that's also with scholarship, you can lose a lot of readers that way. Like, oh good, we're reading another book written by the same people, a leather love fest. You know, where's the, kind of, where is the, um, the objectivity? Everything is subjective, obviously, but like, where is like the attempt to be more objective and scholarly and academic? And that's how you launch a serious writer's serious study. And I think that's the direction that we're going in. That's what we were trying to do. That was the attempt. Yeah. 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 Or well intentioned. Oh, Marsha. Yes. Contributor Marsha Meyer has your Yay. hand up. <laughs> My contribution is probably the least academic of any of them. And my writing coach is sitting right next to me, thank <laughs> heaven. And, um, and he is also right up there after 18 edits, I think. Um, but I learned a whole lot. He was great. I just want to say what I wrote about was creating a community of readers. And what I am always amazed at after being a librarian for 40-some years, how humble the authors and how excited they are to come to my house and have cookies and talk <laughs> to my book group. I, and, of course, Bonnie Jo always said, yes, I'll come. You know, I shouldn't say this with her publishers right here. But um, she would never charge anything. All I had to have was grapes. <laughs> that was it. No cookies, grapes. But one thing I want to say is with Bonnie, she, you communicate with people. I mean, you communicate with people wherever you are. And I think there's an empathy in you that relate, that, 
transfers from that into your book. I feel that, and I don't know all the the tropes or whatever there is in the literature, but I, what I feel is Bonnie Jo. And when I first met you, you become a friend right away. Yeah. You just, uh, you, uh, you almost become family right away. And that feeling transfers over to your characters. There's an empathy. You get into that. You pierce their soul. And there's something about that, and it makes it really easy to push books as a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I really appreciate that. But I am in awe of you. I am in awe of the, the authors we have in this area, the authors that we have in Michigan, and the editors for all you do to get that information out. It's just amazing. So a big applause for all of you, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, switch up. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> Take a shift. We've got uh, we've got the experts here. What's your favorite Bonnie Joe Campbell book? And you can join in too, Bonnie, if you want to. All right, I'll start. Um, I have a PhD, so I can speak in generalities. Why not sweeping generalities? Right, <laughs> sweeping generalizations. That's my game, right? Um, I love the short story form. I'm an Ernest Hemingway scholar. His short stories are some of the best written in the language. Um, I think American Salvage is one of the best books of the last 35 years. Um, it's, it's one of the best short story collections I've, I've ever read. Um, that's true, yeah, yeah. Um, it is one of the most teachable collections of short stories that I, that I own. Um, my students eat it up every single term that I, I, I foisted upon them. Um, they are blown away for a number of reasons, uh, language, um, conflict, um, poetry, heartbreak. Um, my favorite story in that collection, though, is not one of her most well-known stories. Um, my favorite story is Winter Life, which is a quiet story about a quiet Midwestern couple in the middle of a quiet Midwestern winter. And um, yeah, American Salvage is a, is a tour de force. I don't think I can do this, uh, Tom. I'm sorry, but uh, I feel like it's so difficult to pick a Bonnie story. Um, I will say I've had such fun this year going back and reading her first collection, of Women and Other Animals, and there's much to be delighted in that, in that collection. Um, and I think if I had to pick, I mean, I'd have to pick one from each. I mean, sure. Really? Yeah. OK. Um, Why not? You're writing her biography, Lisa. Go right ahead. <laughs> you know, this is. It, do you feel the pressure here? I'm, no. I'm feeling no. it. I'm feeling it. Um, I would say in that collection, Women and Other Animals, I really like a short story called Shotgun Wedding. I really do. And I, Bonnie was just telling us a little bit of history behind that title. So it's always fun to kind of hang out with her and get these little bits about, oh, I, they didn't really want me to title it that. Here's what they suggested. Um, and then I think in American Salvage, actually one of my favorite stories is The Inventor of 1972. And now that I've learned a little bit more about Cooper Pond and Comstock, it makes even more sense to me, that story. So, um, and then in Mothers Tell Your Daughters, I really love the title, collect, the title story of that collection. It's lyrical. It's, I think, one of the most, uh, I mean, it's painful as Bonnie will not let go of, of the pain sometimes. But the, uh, the lyricism of that story is delightful. And who doesn't love Once Upon a River? Right. Um, so there's so much to be said. Okay, Andy, I'm going to stop. I also hate favorite questions. I'm bad at them. So uh, my my favorite story is the Trespasser. Uh, the way that it sort of folds time and realizations together, and it's it's this like beautifully written story that is also just horrifying and like gross and different like. And it really sort of runs the gamut and sort of pulls you along in different ways. Um, and I, I, I do love Once Upon a River, but I grew up on a farm, and so Q Road is, of the novels is probably the one that, that I gravitate uh, toward the most. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to stop because I could just keep talking. Well, but, keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah.
Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in Comstock and when uh, and had uh, Bonnie and Lisa in class and such like that. When Bonnie Jo came into my class, she sat in the front row and she, when she started talking, her voice boomed and everybody else just looked around. <laughs> and I thought, she must be from Comstock. <laughs> and, she, and she was. But my colleagues would say to me, and I'm not going to say who they are, the problem with Bonnie Jo is she makes Comstock sound so bad. People aren't really like that. It's really kind of icky. And I said, no, no. <laughs> I, I would say she made it sound pretty damn good, all things considered. Um, my question to you is in a world of um, a person I shouldn't mention named DeSantis. Um, there is a world in this that it's out to get this library, and it's out to get these books, and it's out to decide, to determine who gets to teach what. So, um, and Bonnie's books are so sincere and so beautifully written. Uh, but I, I think that kind, uh, I worry that that kind of work is in jeopardy today in our larger culture. Maybe you all could, because this is a project you all mean, I mean, you're all working on this as hard as you can. But maybe you could speak to this problem right now in our culture. Yeah, I, I teach in Florida. Uh, that's where I live. So this uh, feels very present uh, to me right now. Um, and I, I'm at a private university, but one that is, uh, as you might expect, like has a board of trustees that's beholden to certain uh, political orientations. Uh, and so I, I am concerned that even though my university doesn't have to take those terrible steps, uh, that it will. Uh, and so, you know, as a, as a teacher of literature, um, as, as uh, a leader in, um, in, in my department, um, as a, a parent of school-aged children, uh, that it, it feels uh, very pressing and very targeted, those kinds of arguments. And it also can begin to feel very hopeless at times uh, because when people are making, uh, making those kinds of changes and those kinds of attacks, I think very clearly they are not beholden to the people in their community. They are making those arguments ideologically, and they, they are listening to a few people in the community, um, but not necessarily to the majority. Uh, in, in my uh, county, there were several books that were challenged for inclusion in Volusia County Schools libraries. And there were there was a whole, there was like 72 challenged, um, a, a couple were removed, uh, and then 19 went to these committees uh, of, that were made up of librarians and teachers and principals and community members. And all 19 of them were voted to be kept in school libraries. Each one, each one of those 19 committees, which were made up of seven to nine people, they were all made up of nine people, but seven to nine voted uh, in each of those meetings, decided to keep those books. And in response to that, our school board tried to change the rules for what would happen when a book was challenged. They didn't go quite as far as they wanted to, to make it easier to remove books. But they did make it harder, and they've changed the system because they didn't like that the community said, actually, this is good. Uh, but what was great about that, what, what makes me somewhat more, maybe not optimistic, because you can see my face, <laughs> but it's a lot better than it could be, is that so many people were involved. And people are going to the school board meetings, and they're speaking, and they're, they're, like, they're on YouTube, you know, and, and um, they're holding, I, I went and held a sign outside the school board meeting one day. Uh, and so I think the only way to deal with this, is, I mean, is to get on your school board, uh, is to show up, to talk to your school board member, um, to volunteer to be a part of those uh, community service roles 
that can help make a difference here because I think that the, the only way to stop this, this um, ideological attack on, on reading and openness and education is, is to be involved and it's to beat them. Mm -hmm. It's to beat them at the smallest level every single time because that's, that's the only way that, that these kinds of communities, I mean, uh, Marcia says that she wrote something that was not, not academic and it, it wasn't full of footnotes. But it was about, like she said, creating a community of readers and about what it means to nurture that and how that happened in Kalamazoo and in Comstock. But, but that's a model, and that's one of the things we wanted to include a librarian in this collection because these are the kind of people uh, who are working to give us a space to do stuff like this. Right. You know, and to show our pride in our authors who are writing like, with, in a loving way but about really challenging and traumatic things. And, like, and that matters, and we need to do our part. And you know, I, I worked on this book, and I showed up at a school board meeting, and that's, like, that's something that we can all do, right? right? And so like, that, that is how I feel like I have to participate in the world uh, in response to, to these kinds of attacks. We have another question. Somebody's already got the mic. Okay. okay. I wrote my question. Oh, hello, hello. I wrote my question down, so I'm looking down. Um, but I read American Salvage for the first time this year in 2023. Um, so my approach to it was kind of naturally a like COVID era lens that I'm reading with. Um, and given that one of the threads in the collection is like economic anxiety, Y2K panic, I'm curious um, to hear from editors and contributors and Bonnie also. Um, if writing this through the COVID, like the acute years and months of the COVID pandemic um, impacted or influenced your approach to the text, your interpretations of the text, especially when it comes to um, sort of Y2K focused pieces like World of Gas and Fuel for the Millennium. Garth would have been perfect for that. We have a contributor who wrote on that and is not present. No But way. I'm wondering whether, Charles, would you want to address the economics? Charles wrote a chapter on, I know, right? Sorry, sorry to put Charles, you on the spot. Charles Cunningham wrote a, wrote a chapter on American salvage and, and um, economic and capitalism uncertainty and stuff like that. So Charles can have something yeah, to say. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I can summarize those arguments, but I, I mean, uh, I was going to ask this question. So I'm turning it into a question for Bonnie uh, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm rereading uh, Mothers Tell Your Daughters uh, right now and Boy, there's so many painful things that happen to people in your uh, fiction, generally, and yet it never seems to me that it gives in to despair. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you about how you think of that, because it, it, it strikes me that you're unstinting in a description of a world that's harsh, and in my mind, it's because of the social order has much to do with it, not to mention nature occasionally. Uh, Kicking our asses too, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I can say, I, I mean, I can say that uh, I, I do write about difficult things, and I never want to pretend they're not difficult. You know how clever of you to like just throw that out. <laughs> can you believe he did that? <laughs> um, but I mean, the the pro I mean, and people are like, why do you write about depressing things? And I, I do write some funny stories that are lighter, but um, I write about the things I worry about. And I see the very struggles that I write about. I see these very struggles, and I want to explore them. But if, you know, I think it's a, maybe it's a, a middle class kind of smugness that makes you think that if life is really hard, you, you give up or something, <laughs> you know? Because life is really hard for most people in the world. But we don't, you know, people don't give up. You know, people keep struggling. And I think you'll notice that if you know a lot of working class people, or a lot of people have been in poverty for a long time, um, they will really be able to have a sense of humor about the very worst things that happen. I mean, often we're having pity for them, and they're laughing. And it's, it's not, I mean, it's not even an ironic laughter, but it's, it's a kind of laughter that, like, look what life is dishing out to us now. 
Um, and I think, I mean, I come from a family where people would come home from a very difficult situation and sit down and put their feet up and pour a drink and make a story out of it. You know, whatever outrageous thing just happened, whatever indignity just happened, and to make a story out of it because a story is something that we can share. And I, I do worry sometimes that, I mean, I think Mothers Tell Your Daughters was a, okay, uh, American Salvage is basically a book about men making a, you know, making a certain transition into the, the 21st century. Um, and that's why the way, Y2K stories are relevant in there. Um, but, and then a Mothers Tell Your Daughters is, and so a lot of the stories for the men was, a lot of the stories had to do with economic issues and getting by with less and the indignity of not having a good job anymore because these jobs disappeared. But I saw that the problems for, mother, for women were different, uh, had a different flavor. And so the stories I'm writing are about difficult stories about being a mother. And it's hard, I think, for all of us to read or even to think about bad mothering. I think we can think about bad fathering a lot easier. It's a lot easier. When we think about bad mothering, um, I think it just makes us uneasy to our very core. Whatever kind of mothering we had, and whatever kind of mothering we provided to those around us, we are just, we're still afraid of bad mothering. We're afraid even to tell stories about it. All we want to do is we want to, we want to damn bad mothering. We want to, cur we want to condemn bad mothering without even really exploring it. And so I'm really interested in the project of, you know, exploring bad mothering. And so I think that I'll be curious what happens over time with Mothers Tell Your Daughters because I think it was a hard book to read for, for everyone, I think. I knew if I waggled it at you, somebody would take me up on it. This is a question for um, the panelists as well as any contributors in the room. Um, as we talked about in some of the opening remarks, this book became out of the field of the study of Midwestern literature. Um, so this is criticism about Midwestern literature, about Michigan literature. And so two very broad questions to kind of zoom out again. Um, in your opinion, what is Midwestern literature? <laughs> and or why is it important that we champion it, that we study it, that it remains at the epicenter of our literary criticism activities? So who wants to go first? <laughs> I'm pretty sure our contributors should answer, uh, should start answering that first. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, Doug has an answer. Good for you, Doug. <laughs> um, my, my contribution is um, uh, a teaching chapter about, I, I teach a lot of second language learners of English and teaching uh, Bonnie's work to, to that. So um, mm -hmm. the idea of the Midwesterner is changing and shifting and it has always been an immigrant story. Um, it has always been um, sort of, a, a big piece of it is an immigrant story. And the, the idea that these students are coming here either temporarily or permanently I kind of want to give them a broader understanding of what the Midwest is as a being because so many of my students know New York and LA and then they land in Chicago where I teach and they're just kind of like, oh, it's like New York or LA. And I was like, you need to shut your mouth right now. <laughs> um, no, not really. But the, <laughs> the, the thing that they get out of it is because te I'll teach Bonnie in tandem with Richard Wright and Nelson Algren and um, a lot of these like, Sherwood Anderson, all of these sort of like Midwestern sort of ideas come out, and my students are really noticing this idea of there's sort of, I think the biggest thing, especially if we're going to be talking about what does that mean, they didn't see themselves as Midwesterners coming in and then leaving the class they kind of do. Because I was like, no, you're here, and you're interacting, and you're seeing all, and you're bringing those values and absorb, and the Midwest is such a, a place of absorption rather than mm -hmm. um, sort of <clears throat> f 
flag raising, I guess, uh, that you would get in, in other regions. Uh, and I think that that would be what I think I was trying to do is showing them how the text shifts over time and how they are part of creating that shift and right. doing that. So to me, it's this like open border. Give it to Raymond. Somebody has a follow-up question? Oh. No, we're gonna, and, and then we're going to go to Becky next. Becky's next. Yeah. I, yeah. Yep, you're next. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You're, yep. you're next. You're going to say something. Yeah. <laughs> Start thinking about it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really like what you had to say about uh, Midwesterners absorbed, too. I think uh, Midwestern, I'm Raymond. I wrote, I, I wrote a, a pedagogy chapter on teaching this to creative writing, this meaning her, to creative writers. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I'm a writer in my own right, too. Right, right. Um, Plug your book. Plug your book, please. No. I, I, Enough I, to Lose by Raymond Deeran coming out from Wayne State UP. In September. And I just blurbed it, yes. and it's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> if, if any of you wondered what is going on in the thumb, thumb region. <laughs> read Raymond's book, which is go. coming out in September. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so in many ways, that's Midwestern <laughs> literature right there. So I see it as absorption, but also it's like this active resistance to coastal uh, ideas of who we are. And we are um, in many ways connected. We stick up for each other, and we resist the ways people think of us, the, the way people think literature can be. Um, uh, Middle-class sensibilities read books differently than working-class sensibilities. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to conflate Midwest with working class. But when we talk about the Great Recession, we talk about inflation nowadays. Like four dollars for a dozen eggs hits different in Cairo, Michigan, than it does in New York City, where it's probably been four dollars for 15 years. I don't know. Um, I also have a PhD, so I can make a bro broad generalization. <laughs> broad strokes. Yeah, right. broad, broad strokes. strokes. <laughs> broad strokes. And my advisor isn't here to tell me to go. So, so yeah, I think we absorb what people say of us, but then we resist it. Um, and I think that that shows in the conflict. So our conflicts, you know, conflict in short, conflict in Midwestern literature can be really quiet and it can be really beautiful. And there's a ton of humor in it, as Bonnie was saying. Yeah. I can ramble. Very good. Very good. Take it off. <laughs> Maybe Becky could say what she wrote about, too. Sure. Yeah, say what, say what you wrote about and sort of uh, pull it together. Do what you can. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, hi. Um, I wrote about teaching Once Upon a River to teenagers. So this ties into um, some of the other comments brought up, especially Catherine's comment about uh, feeling pressure or tension or worry about how long can I keep teaching this text. Um, and I always ask students their preference. How do you feel? We've just read a pretty chewy piece of literature during a time where uh, things are difficult. Is this okay? Should we bring this to the table again next year? And I've only had one student say, don't bring it back. Um, and that's because they like sci-fi. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I'm really confident that it's a book that I can keep bringing back just to explain to anybody who has an objection that, you know, these are the kids themselves saying, we need this. We need to have these conversations. We see ourselves in some of what happens to Margot. We see ourselves in these conundrums. Um, and I think also, Catherine, you're the one who said, there's something about the sincerity of which you write uh, these situations that really resonates with them, as Midwesterners, too. Uh, they're conscious of the fact that many of them are about ready to embark upon life after high school. They're taking their APs. They're getting ready to do something different or new. Um, and are they going to stay here? And some of them are looking outward. And others who are getting, say, the Kalamazoo Promise are excited to stick around and use that to their advantage. But there's, um, there's a sense of, and what's the word, resistance? Yes, there's a sense of resistance to being pinned down, stereotyped, but there's also a pride in, but we're also like this. <laughs> they want people to know that they are also earnest 
and very concerned about what's happening in the world around them. Um, they read a story like Margot's, and they're up in arms. They want to see something different. They want to see this addressed. And these are what our conversations center on. Um, so that is my privilege to be able to witness that in action. Hi, I actually just wanted to also say that I am privileged to be a friend of Becky's who has observed her grading and working with these students, and I wanted her to expand a little bit on some of the stunning projects that have come out of this. Yeah. Because they're beautiful. And Which you can see in the book. Yeah, there's her, yeah, you should yeah. flip through the and book. And maybe yeah. just clarify which yeah. students you're teaching. I mean, they're an exceptional group of students. Yes. Too. Um, I teach uh, for Western uh, college age students, but the program that I use uh, Bonnie Joe's work with primarily is with high school students who are in a program called ATIP. And these are students who have tested in or they have been recommended by their school counselors to skip general high school English and come over and hang out with me at Western and study there. Um, and by the end of the year, which is when we jump into Bonnie's book, they're burnt out with writing essays. <laughs> and so <laughs> I ask them to write reflections, but I also invite them to, instead of doing an essay, please choose a different artistic medium and create a piece of art that resonates with their own experience with the novel. And they get to choose what, what they want to focus on. They get to choose what they've grappled with the most. They get to choose what delighted them the most. I invite them to also choose a medium that they've never tried before, because now's a great time to do that. I'm, I'm not an art instructor, so I can't, I can't score on how well they create, but I can only score on how well they try um, and the thought that they put into it. They, we've had people do original music compositions. We have had people do uh, choreographed dance, perform it in the woods, take photographs of that and show it to their classmates. We've had sculptures where one student went out in the yard and dug up bones. Um, we've had another student who did a sculpture of bringing a bunch of twigs together into a female shape that just looked so remarkable, the whole class gasped. Um, we've had collections of poems. We've had watercolor sketchbooks created of all the characters, um, slam poetry. Uh, film. We've had five-minute films created out of this. Anything you can really imagine. Uh, I've had a student pull a friend who goes to her school who's not in our program to accompany her on ukulele so she could sing to us. <laughs> <laughs> so they've just charmed me beyond belief. Um, but also, I have to confess that every single year they make me cry. Um, they probably make me cry right now thinking about it. <laughs> Um, but they're amazing, and they need this. They really need this. So I'm happy to provide this opportunity and shepherd it into being. And it's Bonnie Joe's work that makes it happen. So thank you. And I think we're going to thank you so much, Becky. I think we have to wrap it up so we can actually sign and all that. We, okay, okay. We, well, I, I have to say we have to make an exception. <laughs> Dr. Shirley Skates. Well, we want to thank you all for coming, and we do have these books for sale, and we're happy to sign, and Bonnie's happy to all sign. The and all the contributors will come up here and sign. So if you buy a book, everybody will sign their chapter. So And, and we do have a reception Ooh, yes. event. Okay, Bonnie, go ahead. Yes, you're all invited at 4.30. We're having a reception party. I mean, it's just an excuse to be together, all of us writers and readers, at Sarkozy Bakery, they're closing. They're when they as soon as they close, they're they're going to sweep the floors, and at 4:30 we're going <laughs> to drink, and we're going to give you stuff to drink and eat. They said they're going to sweep the floors, so but we don't care. <laughs> but please, and we have a cake. 
with the book cover oh, on it. Book, book cover, cover. On it. and it's from Boone's oh. Ayers. It's yeah. it's not from Meyer. I mean, nothing wrong with a Meyer cake, but <laughs> this is from Boone's Ayers. So come over and join us at Sarkozy Bakery at 4:30. And Brian is here, our buddy Brian, who made us some crostinis to eat. Is he here? Oh, he left because he's making crostinis for with Sarkozy bread. So please come up and talk to us. And then join us in an hour at Sarkozy and let's sort of party a little bit over the subject of literature and all these fabulous writers who are in the room. So thank you. Book bug, right? Book bug. Yeah. Book bug.